Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. Hey, and welcome to episode 201 of the podcast. In this episode, I talk with my friend Nick Ballard all about their experience with online kids and student ministry and then meeting in person with kids in student ministry. And so you'll love hearing from that conversation and whether or not you're meeting in person or not, it is still very, very helpful. And I would tell you that even since we recorded this uh, conversation a few weeks ago, I think they're kind of pulling back, adding more restrictions, you know, moving away from some of the opening up stuff that they were doing with kids in student ministry in light of COVID-19. Now, before we jump into that interview, there's something I really want you to hear about if you serve in children's ministry, but maybe even student ministry, because there should be could be some unique ways to do this in student ministry. In fact, we're doing it for incoming sixth graders. You may have heard of a lot of leaders that are creating boxes in their church to send home to their families. Maybe it's a monthly box for parents to use with the kids' ministry curriculum to help them apply that at home and engage more with the content that you're putting out. Or maybe it's a a special box, like I mentioned, for our rising sixth graders or seniors graduating, things like that. You, know, you can use them for a number of different ways. Well, we're having a webinar with Ministry Boost that we pulled together quickly here. It's happening this week, so if you listen when the episode comes out, August 13th, 1230, just go to ministryboost.org. You can find a link there to register. Or if you miss it, you'll be able to go and watch the replay, which you're going to want to do because we've been able to find a great source to get custom printed boxes. And we're going to have a bundle that you can get with all the ideas and scripts and resources and communication and template files and things like that. You can use to create that box to send home. Maybe it's monthly for kids ministry. Maybe it's a one-off thing. You're going to do something for Christmas or for a student ministry gathering or something like that. There's lots of different uses for it. We're really excited. I'm doing it in my church. Uh, Kenny is doing it in his church, and so and we, you know, lots of our friends are doing it as well. And so we're learning from all of them how they're doing it. So check out ministryboost.org to sign up for that webinar or watch the replay. And then the new digital church course launched, but you can still get in. Uh, you'll just have to watch a week or two on demand and then catch the rest live. And you can check that out at newdigitalchurch.com. As always, you can get the links and notes and all of that, including everything I just mentioned, at nickblevins.com slash episode 201. Let's go ahead now and listen to my conversation with Nick Ballard, all about in-person kids and student ministry. Well, today I'm talking with somebody with an awesome name uh, on the podcast. It's Nick <laughs> Ballard. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Good to be here. It's funny, every time I uh, see your uh, initials on a, a Zoom call or a Skype call, I just I, I always think it's me, and it's I realize, no, it's not me. It's the, the other Nick B. <laughs> That's right. I didn't even think about the fact <laughs> that we have the same last initial. Yeah, we were doing that uh, interview yesterday that we're probably going to air on the podcast after this with you and Bill, and when Kenny jumped on and said, Nick, like he's talking, he said, Nick, I'm just so used to him kicking something to me, you know, and when we do these ministry boost video calls or whatever, I almost talked. I was like, oh, he meant you. That's right. That makes more sense because I'm not the one that's, you know, the <laughs> guest on, on this uh, this video thing. So I think I funny. think when we do calls together, I need to come up with a, you know, a screen name that's different. There you make go. Make it easier. We <laughs> should. I mean, just the two of us, though. I think we should be, uh, we <laughs> okay, should be yeah. okay. That's true. Yeah. yeah, we should be all right. Well, tell us about you, your family, and your church. Yeah, yeah. So um, I am a, the next gen pastor at Harvester Christian Church, which is outside of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, technically, St. Charles. It's about a 25 uh, mile uh, drive west of St. Louis, and uh, been on staff here for about 10 years. Uh, started off as a high school pastor. Um, and then moved over into the next general. Before that, I was the middle school and high school pastor at a church in central Ohio in Columbus uh, and did that for about six years. So uh, really kind of uh, settled into this role of overseeing our kids and student staff uh, over uh, at Harvester. And uh, really, as a, as a student pastor, I spent a, a lot of time learning kids ministry uh, and growing in that area. I felt way more comfortable in student ministry, but have learned a ton. Uh, I have a wife. Her name's Blair. She's a physical therapist. 
And I have two daughters, eight and six, Blythe and Bristol, and uh, they are just a ball of fun. And I love this age that they're in right now, that eight and six year old, like where they're where they're independent, but also they still love being around mom and dad, and uh, it's it's that's a lot of fun. So uh, they are at a, a great stage in life right now, and I don't know. I think I say that every stage. I, I just really enjoy the the stages that they they go through. But then when you look back on it, like I don't want to go back to any stage. I just enjoy the stage <laughs> that they're yeah. in right now. You know, so uh, it's good. We're we're uh, like everybody navigating through what uh, schooling looks like and working from home and and all that stuff. And so uh, it's been a it's been a very interesting year. And and on top of that, how to do ministry and do it effectively. Well, to give some people like a kind of a frame of reference, talk a little bit about Harvester Church and what kids ministry, student ministry was like pre COVID, just to give people a sense. And then we'll talk about what you know what changed and what did you all do after. Uh, March when COVID, you know, stopped you meeting in person and all that. So tell us a little bit about Harvester. Yeah. So Harvester is a, it's a non-denominational Christian church and uh, it's been around since like, I think 1980. And it's a, a phenomenal story, just kind of how it's got to be where it's at. So uh, our, the, the lead pastor, the senior pastor before I got to Harvester, his name was Ben Merrill. And he's a very well known in the Christian church, Church of Christ uh, brotherhood. And he uh, retired from ministry at age 65 out in California, but he he thought kind of his retirement job would be moving to, to St. Charles, Missouri and taking on a senior pastor position at a church of 300. And, and so he landed at Harvester at age 65, ended up doing ministry until he really retired at age 82. And the church during that time grew from 300 to about 3,000. Uh, in his retirement years. And uh, it really, really blew up. And he really had uh, this heart for the community and and serving people. And and Harvester kind of became a church where we cared about uh, the people in our in our area and community, and that's that's really kind of how it, it started to grow. And and so uh, so after that, uh, we we went through um, just uh, a few, several years of of kind of growing from that and, and f- figuring out our identity. And uh, right now we're a church of about twenty five hundred over uh, two campuses. We have our our main campus, or well, not our main campus, but the campus where everything kind of mm-hmm. comes out of. Is uh, is in St. Charles, and it is really out of the 2,500 uh, on a weekly basis. There's 2,300 out of that campus, and then we have a smaller campus about 40 miles west of us in rural Missouri, and uh, that that church is about 200. Way different demographic, just different everything. So we've learned a lot of how to have two completely separate campuses under the same umbrella. Uh, and so for for next gen, that's that's been a learning curve as well. Uh, figuring out you know what does kids ministry look like on both campuses and student ministry look like on both campuses and and things like that. So there's been a, a lot of changes over the last ten years and and one of the one of the biggest changes that that we've t- we've done uh, probably happened about five years ago with student ministry and this was a something that our, our student ministry team spent a lot of time going through and researching but. We, we wanted to address the problem of where our students are going after high school. You know, we, we know that this is a, a nationwide problem, it's a church problem that, that teenagers tend to graduate high school and also graduate from the church. And we, we noticed that. We noticed that our, our college young adult ministry was, was pretty much non existent. And, and students were going, you know, either to other churches where it was existent or they were just, walking away from the church. And and that was a problem. And we, we've realized that uh, not only is it a church problem, but it really is a student ministry problem. Like, how are we contributing to that problem? And and so we, we went on a year-long uh, research project of of what we, you know, what we need to change in student ministry. We did surveys to, to students and to, to parents and to uh, our our staff and just everybody like former students and uh, compiled a, a basically like a just results these survey results a packet of like what what we were doing well what we weren't doing well and really came to the conclusion that that our students were were going through middle school and high school ministry uh, and even kids ministry like going spending their first eighteen years of life 
really detached from the church. And, you know, they were they were in their own church world and church bubble. And all of a sudden they graduate high school and we kick them out of that. And they don't know what to do after that. They don't they you know, they may have never set foot in the worship center. Um, you know, they it's you know, our our student ministry uh, has a, a separate building across the parking lot. And so for a lot of them, like that's their that's their church for seven years. And then and then we're telling them, you're done. You have to leave this building. And they walk into a new building where, you know, it's full of moms and dads and they don't feel like they fit there anymore. And so um, we realized that we needed to address that. And we, we were we were competing, too, uh, with with the church. Like, you know, we would have our worship on Sunday mornings uh, parallel to the the main worship services. A lot of times doing the same songs. We're passing communion. We're passing offering. Like we're doing a lot. We're doing a message, and it's like we were we were competing in a sense with um, our worship services, and we realized that that it was not only not necessary to do that, but it was actually probably detrimental to our our teenagers that were graduating high school and moving on. And so we we realized like we needed to stop doing that. We needed to just stop with the. The student ministry programming on Sunday morning, we needed to put all of our eggs into the church basket and say, uh, no, this is your church. You're part of this church now. And and then uh, hopefully, you know, when they graduate high school, when they graduate from the student ministry, this is not a foreign ground to them. And so we we started to to make those changes. We we went through several months. Like we knew we were going to pull the trigger, but we went through several months of communicating that to uh, to people. You know, we talked with our our elders, our leadership, our uh, parents, our key volunteers. Like we we had focus groups and and all that. And because we knew that anytime you pull programming, like just completely cut programming, which is your large mass amount of people on Sunday morning. Um, people aren't going to just accept that and be okay mm-hmm. with that. That's sure. that's a big deal, right? Like when you're used to bringing your kid to their program that they like every Sunday morning and then that that's cut, they're like, well, what do you, what are you going to do for my kids? Or, you know, why are you taking this away? It's, it's the, the thinking of like, what, what about now? Like, what are they going to do now? And so one of the things we try to communicate is we got to look, we got to look past now. We got to look at what happens later. And, um, and one of the things we figured out is like, so I think so much, so often we're so concerned about where the student ministry is now that we neglect the church in the future. And, and that was a big deal. And so we, we communicated that, you know, and what we found was that, that parents and, and, and leaders and staff and, even students like they they began to grasp that when they understood the why of it and you know when you talk to a parent you say hey you know you want your kid to stick around after high school right like you want them to feel like they're a part of the church and they're like absolutely you know and this is why we're doing this and um and so we we made large strides to to plug our students in so it's not so much just hey you're done with student ministry program on Sunday morning now go to church it's how can you contribute to the church how can you have ownership in the church. And, um, you know, obviously like, um, a lot of, a lot of our research also came from what Fuller Institute's doing and, and Carapal mm-hmm. and, and, you know, the growing young book. I mean, what a phenomenal book that is. And they talk about how you're, you're, you're handing the keys of leadership over and, um, man, it's, it's so good. And that's so true. And so we, we, we knew we had to do that. We, we knew we had to start handing the keys of leadership over to students. And so we, laid out all the ministries and said, Hey, we, we don't expect you just to come on Sunday morning, but you gotta, you, know, you gotta plug in and serve and lead. And, and so, you know, just seeing an influx of students start serving in kids ministry and, and then just all over, like, uh, you know, you see the, see middle school boys running the cameras in the worship center and seeing, you know, middle schoolers also serving the cafe and ho- holding doors open and greeting people and even high school students being prayer partners uh, as was pretty awesome. And so we started seeing what, what used to be our student ministry was, was not visible because they're in another building. 
we became very visible because there were teenagers all around. There were student staff around to talk to families and new families. Uh, and we even we even created a student section in the worship center so, so teenagers could worship together still. And so um, that was a huge move for our ministry and our church. Our church really began to uh, become more of a a younger church in a sense where teenagers were around a lot. And so there was more energy and excitement. And that was something to where that was, it was just very infectious to, to everyone around. And so uh, even our, then we, we put all of our eggs, student ministry eggs and in, in different baskets, like on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and our attendance started to grow there too. And so, um, so it was a really neat thing to, to see transform and see even looking back now, how, how those five years have kind of sh- started to shape our church in a way that uh, continuing student ministry programming on Sunday mornings, the way we were doing it, uh, wouldn't have done. And, and seeing seeing more young adults in our church now because of that, they they graduate from high school and they continue to serve in different areas that they were serving in, and it feels like their church now. And so, uh, so it's really it was really neat to to see that and to see just the effects of. What, you know, and, and we started, yeah, I know like some, some churches you see high schoolers really doing that, but we started in sixth grade. We say in sixth grade, you're, you're now serving and you're part of the church. And, um, and our parents have really gotten behind that because they see the effects of it. And so that's been a really neat thing, um, to, to watch and to, to, to grow in and also, you know, to talk with other, other churches that are, are going through that and they see um, what an impact that has on them. And so, um, so that's a big thing for our student ministry and, um, and just the, the outlook of our church per se. Yeah. And then dun, 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 COVID came in and shut things down yeah. in a sense. And so you had to change everything like everybody else. So what did um kids ministry, we've talked, you put, you know, you put that, content online, added some of your own custom yeah. content, you use orange, but what did student ministry look like? Yeah. Student ministry was, man, a different beast, right? Like, and we've, we've looked at a lot of churches around the country and what they did for, and everybody's doing something different, but you know, uh, we, we ended up doing like a live, uh, show every Wednesday and everything we can, we, we created a studio for all of our ministries and everybody kind of had a different time slot and we called it harvester at home. And, uh, you know, like Wednesday was student ministry and Thursday was uh, senior adults ministry and Monday was adult ministry. And, uh, Saturday was our kids ministry slot. So it was like almost like Saturday morning cartoons. Right. And, and everybody could tune mm-hmm. in live and, 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 you know, experience their ministry. And so that's what we did for student ministry. We tried to try to make it as interactive as possible through the live chat and uh, church online platform and, and, and things like that. And that, it was, it worked okay. You know, it was, it was something where we saw everything online student ministry wise, we saw a lot more middle school engagement than anything. They were, they were loving it. And even after doing the live show, we went to zoom and our middle schoolers just kind of flocked to that and they loved it. And high schoolers, it was a little more challenging to get them engaged in that zoom type of, of ministry. And so we were itching to, to get back to, you know, you can, you have this like helpless feeling of, you know, is, is the ministry falling apart? You know, you're just trying to do everything you can to, to keep groups together and keep engagement with students and kids and uh, families. And, and then through all this time, I'm sure like many churches, you start to see online engagement just start to drop and drop. And then not just with kids ministry and student ministry, but, you know, just all your live online worship services that started to drop after Easter. And, and you're just kind of sitting there like, you, in a sense, you kind of feel like, are we on a, like, we're on a sinking ship. Like there's nothing, like you're just trying to put water out with buckets and, you know, just hoping for the day you can start doing ministry again in a, in a in-person setting. And so it was a, like, like all churches, you're just, you're just trying to, um, you know, call audibles and, and make decisions on the fly. And, you know, you, you just know you're in a time where if that doesn't work, we'll try something else. And, and that was what, uh, most of may look like for, for our ministry. Well, and that's the attitude you need, right? Like let's try this and see if that works. Yep. And especially and in digital, not. in digital ministry and things like that. Well, you did with student ministry launch again, first with small groups in person and then l- large group in July. So tell us about both of those. What did it look like and how to go? Yeah. So our, our church kind of came up with a three phase opening plan and phase one was the ability to gather in small groups. And so 
that really affected student ministry probably more than most other ministries in the in the church because um, just of our our student ministry is just founded on small groups and everything we do is on that foundation. And so, um, so we, we typically give our, our small group leaders the summer off and, and I made the plea with them to say, Hey, this summer is obviously different. Can you stay on for June and July? And because that's the only type of ministry we can do right now. We were, we were definitely done with zoom. We, we didn't want to do that anymore. And so, um, so starting in June, when we, we started phase one, we, we began meeting student ministry in small groups. And obviously those were conversations we had to have with our small group leaders too. Like, you know, there were some small group leaders that just weren't comfortable with doing that yet. And, and so all of our groups have two to three leaders. So, for most of our groups, we, at least one leader was fine with meeting, and they they got creative with you know meeting at parks or in driveways or backyards or or things like that. And then you then you had the leaders that were like, "Oh, just meet in my living room; it's fine." Yeah, you know, they didn't care. And so so all groups began to meet again in small groups, and it was it was amazing. Like we we saw attendance shoot back up uh, from. Uh, from Zoom and and students started showing up and it was a relief to us and to our leaders. Like, you know, we had leaders that they would have like one kid show up on Zoom and get so discouraged over that time. And then as soon as we got back, like all of a sudden their group comes back and they're like, oh, they they are still here and we didn't lose them. And and so it was, it was a neat thing to do. So we did like like video teaching, had each group watch a video and then they they talk about that. And um, so we saw uh, saw so small groups really make a rebound in June for us, which was which was huge. And then and then phase two for us was meeting in larger groups. And so uh, we thought, you know, okay, once phase two happens in our church, we're going to be able to go to a large group format, kind of like what what we normally have done. And so for our high school ministry, uh, we in a typical pre-COVID world, we were doing Sunday night ministry. First and third Sunday nights, they would meet in homes and small groups. And second and fourth Sunday nights, all the small groups would come together uh, in our, our student building and we would have worship and, and teaching and then they would break off into groups. And so they would meet every Sunday night, but just kind of a different format. And so we came back as a large group together at the end of June. And it was just uh, such a uh, breath of fresh air because, you know, you, you're kind of wondering, like, are students going to show up? Are parents going to be okay? But, you know, you still need to take precautions. And so, like, we're spacing out chairs and we're uh, we're trying to make sure things are social distance and, and having part of our night outside and, and things like that. And, uh, man, we were blown away. Like, we literally came back with 100% return on that first large group night. The students that that, you know, we're missing in Zoom for for all those weeks that started to come back in the in-person groups and then like fully came back in the large group. Now, like, they were just hungry to see each other and and, and be together. And um, and so we were probably a little closer than we should have been. Uh, you know, there was uh, definitely some shoulder to shoulder. And, um, you know, and at that point, you're kind of like wondering like, oh, man, this isn't good. But at the same time, that's kind of overwhelmed by a room full of high schoolers worshiping and like hearing them sing and like be together and laughing and smiling. And it's like, man, what a, what an awesome environment moment that was. And so there's some things that we got to look at in the fall and say, like, how does our ministry going to change when we, when we come back together, um, you know, and relaunch because it, it, it will need to look different with more precautions and, um, and, and our middle school ministry too. Like they're, they're, they're doing things, they're doing more things outside and, and fun things. But, um, I, I told you this earlier too, like our, our summer is kind of looks a little more normal. Like we just got back from high school camp. We did uh, a week of camp that, uh, normally we, we go to CIY and they canceled all their things. So we jumped on a local camp that's still having all their weeks. And, uh, we were able to have a great week of camp and, uh, and then next week we're, we're heading out to middle school camp. And so in a, in a lot of ways, our summer looks different, but it also like we're, we're doing more ministry than we thought we would be doing like, and not, not just ministry, but in-person ministry. Uh, obviously everybody's doing ministry, but we're doing in-person, mm-hmm. more in-person ministry than we thought we would be doing, uh, over the summer. And that's been awesome. You know, it's just been so great. Um, so we're trying to balance that with like, um, taking the precautions we need. Um, we have our, our senior milestone this Sunday night. And and so still creating a, a special night for our, our seniors that have missed out on so much this year uh, and their families. And, but, but at the same time, taking precautions necessary. And our, our, our families are very appreciative that, uh, that we are, we're trying to, to get back to things and, and, uh, 
make special events for them, but at the same time, uh, be cautious around that. And so we know everybody's on different ends of the spectrum and, and we're trying to be aware of that and, um, and tread, tread very carefully, but at the same time, uh, do ministry when we can do ministry in, in an in-person setting. Yeah. And for context, you're in an area that, I mean, has not had like a spike. It's not high cases. I'm in Maryland and actually with a lot of the actions that have been taken early, um, you know, our, our peak was in April and it's actually, I mean, you know, relatively speaking for a pretty highly populated area, it's been really good. And you're a third, I looked it up just now and your cases and things like that are uh, a third of what ours are here. Mm-hmm. And again, we're not, you know, in, in so ours has been de- the key numbers have been declining uh, yeah. for a long time. So that helps too. And you're on a break now, like you referenced, you know, when you kind of meet up again in fall, you'll have to think through that. But what was the week? Tell us a little bit more about like the week of camp and how did that work? And I mean, you got another one next week. And, yeah. You know, what was that like? Yeah. And you're right. Like Missouri is, um, we're starting to see some, some spikes, but for the most part, it has been a, a mild state. Uh, and so, and so, you know, our, our church was shut down for, uh, for, you know, 16 weeks uh, or whatever. But uh, at the same time, we started seeing churches in our area start to reopen a little sooner than other churches. And, and we are a large church. And so uh, I think, you know, all in all, we came back around 30%, but, uh, but we see, we, we see families that are, are excited to get back into the in-person. And then, so we were, we, you know, we had no idea what to expect with camp, right? Like our, our students going to sign up for camp or parents going to be okay with them signing up. And, um, and so we, we ended up, we go, went to a local camp. It's a, a, about 40 miles West of us. It's very rural Missouri. And, uh, and it was their biggest high school camp. I think that they they've ever had like the most kids they've ever had. And, um, so it was, there was definitely that they added a high school week this year. Um, they had protocols and precautions in place. Like we did temperature checks every day. They were very cautious. Like parents couldn't walk their, their kids to the dorm or to the cabins. Um, so there were things in place, uh, at the same time, 250 kids on on a camp, uh, you know, you can do so many precautions, but at the end of the day, that's a lot of people together. And so we realized like we're doing the best that we can, but at the same time, when you, when you end the week and you you see the the, the life change that students had and, and baptisms and and things like that, like it, it was a it was an awesome week to be able to to experience with them and uh, and things. And so uh, we we got to um, see you know and and the camp had had plans in place and and you know protocols for for anything that should happen, um, contact tracing plans and and all of that as well. And so and and we knew that. Uh, we made sure our, our families knew like this is, um, you know, we can't guarantee anything uh, when you send your kid. And so and so there were there were families that had intended to go and sign their kids up. But towards the actual week, it camp began to back out. And and we let them know uh, up front, like, hey, you can back out the day of camp. We're going to give you a full refund. Like like we understand everybody's like in different camps and and you you may think that you're ready to to send your kid to camp but as soon as that day comes you might not be ready and that's completely understandable and so um so we had a waiting list we had kids backing out the day of we had kids jumping on the day of and um and so it was all in all a great week and our middle school week uh, is another added week next week and and it's gonna be a little smaller i think a little easier to to distance and to um you know take a little more precautions and space out things but um all in all it was a it was a great experience and and I, we were really glad to be able to to give those students still that that type of week when you know, I don't think anybody coming in a summer thought that, that that would happen or that any in-person type ministry would happen. And, um, and so they were, they were really, um, excited and, and talking with a lot of students is like, they, they needed it. You know, they, they had isolation problems and, you know, discouragement, depression and, and all this stuff. Like it was, it was something that a lot of students, um, cherished. And so it was, a, it was a great week and we were fortunate to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, we're going to share the kind of video conversation that we had in the Ministry Boost Facebook group with you and Bill, and you were talking about meeting in person again as a church and specifically as a children's ministry. So we don't have to dive too far into it right now, but I'd just love to hear you give us a few takeaways from what it's been like to meet in person for, I think, three Sundays at the time we're recording this and with kids ministry. What's that been like? 
Yeah, yeah. And this was something that uh, our church from the very beginning, when we began our three phase plan, we said we were going to not open fully regather on a Sunday morning until we felt like we could regather with full kids ministry. We thought it was very important that when our first Sunday back, our kids could go to their environments and worship. And, and we didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to be excited about coming back and have our kids excited about coming back and then tell our kids, okay, you got to sit with mom and dad and, you know, you can't move around, you can't touch anybody. And, and, you know, cause a lot of kids were hungry and excited to go to church and you don't want to squelch that with, but you can't go to your spaces and see your friends and, and things like that. And so that was, that was important for us to be able to do that. And so, uh, you know, once we found out the date, July 5th was the, was our first Sunday and we knew it was a holiday weekend and, and, and that was kind of intentional in the sense of, uh, it would probably be lower attended than than even uh, a normal weekend with with COVID, and so uh, it was kind of a uh, it was our launch date. But we knew in our back of our minds it was kind of a soft launch date, and to see where we're at, and who was coming back, and um, obviously it was it was uh, the biggest challenge is getting volunteers. Right, you got to get all your small group leaders for kids ministry and and fill those spaces and. And, and like I said, with, with camp, you know, you had a lot of volunteers that were, yeah, I'll be there. Like, I can't wait to be back. And then as you get closer to time, it was, oh, I'm not, actually, I'm not really that comfortable. I thought I was going to be comfortable. I'm not that comfortable. And so, you know, making last minute shifts with, with volunteers and figuring that out. And, and all, all the same, like we didn't know how many people, we didn't do any RSVPs. Our church has not done that. We, we just were wait and see what happens. And so, um, you know, with it being a holiday weekend, we we uh, people came back, but it was lower than we were prepared for, and so that was for us that was a good thing. We had enough leaders. Um, I think I, I I said that we we returned around thirty two percent of our our church came back, mm-hmm. and so uh, that's what we're averaging over those those three weeks. And same with kids ministry around thirty two percent. And so now that we kind of have that pulse, we're able to to plan a little better. But you know, when we when we first made the plan to come back, you know, everybody's mind, when you think about returning, I think just in your mind, you're like returning to normal. Like that's what people think. Like we're going to return to normal. And, and that's what our, you know, our staff was thinking it like everybody, it's just, it's just what you think. Like, all right, back to normal. And as we get closer to time, we realize like, no, there's nothing normal about our return. Like, uh, (laughs) we're, we're going to, we're going to be implementing, you know, social distance. So like every other row is, is roped off and, and, um, and we originally we were like, no, you know, masks aren't going to be mandated, but then, you know, as we got closer to time and just seeing kind of the spikes and in, in cases, we, we decided, all right, staff's going to wear masks. And, and then we, we moved it on to say, actually all volunteers are going to wear masks. And, um, you know, we, we implemented temperature checks for our kids and our staff and our volunteers. And, um, and so then it was, then you have to then make policies for all that. Right. So it's not just implementing them, but it's then, okay, what if, what if you temperature check a kid and it's a red light? Like, what do you do then? And so we had to like think through all that, how to have those conversations with those families and, um, you know, and not, you know, have everybody in line panicking that, that the kid in front of them had a red light. And so they have COVID and it's going to spread it to everybody. And, and so just thinking through stuff like that, but you know, the first three weeks have been great. Like it's, it's been, uh, the, the amount of kids that have come back, the amount of families have come back has actually been good for what we're, you know, what we're able to handle. And, um, and, you know, we've, we, we've had upset people, upset people that, you know, we're not doing enough, obviously, and upset people that uh, we've actually had some kids volunteers look at us and say, Hey, call me when you're not mandating mask and I'll return to serve. But until then I'm not going to serve. And so, um, we understand that, you know, it's, it's a challenge to, to work through all this, but, um, but it's, it's been great to see our kids ministry back and, and, and really doing that in-person, uh, ministry. And, and now our challenge is how do we do an effective in-person ministry and still keep an effective online ministry? Because, you know, with a 30% return, you have 70% that are still watching at home or, or, you know, hopefully watching at home or, or needing that, that type of ministry online. And so, um, so that's been now our, our challenge of how do you, how do you effectively do both and do them both well? Right. Yeah. And I, in my mind, it's like, yeah, there's certain things that we won't necessarily do. Imagine, imagine a day, you know, post COVID let's hope and churches meeting in person. I do firmly believe that, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be a while before churches could get to their pre COVID attendance. 
uh, even if it wasn't a virus, just the idea that you hadn't met in person for so long and then you met mm. for a while with very reduced numbers. Uh, mm-hmm. We had a season in our church history where we moved to, uh, we're moving in the building. It didn't go right. We were sort of homeless for three months. And we, you could actually just run, you know, we looked at the history and you could just see there was about 15% probably that mm. uh, even up to 20% that just, you know, got disconnected, never really came mm. back. You never know if you came back a little bit later or whatever. And we grew moving in the building, but the two were offset each other. You know, there's this portion of people yeah. that kind of just d- disconnected and come back. That was three months. We did still meet for most of that. You know, it's just Saturday night in another church not far north. And and then we didn't meet for five weeks. But so this kind of thing, you know, I, I know a, a good friend of our church that um, runs Christian Financial Resources. He was just speculating. He wouldn't be surprised if churches were you could get to 70 percent you know 80 mm. percent somewhere you know by the next year sometime but then take another couple years if not more you know he was staying like 2022 2023 before a church might reach its pre-covid mm. attendance which is just crazy you know like not crazy i think most of us think well yeah that kind of makes sense yeah but it just changes your approach right so there's lots of things i think we're all going to want to keep doing even if attendance was back to 85 percent or 93 percent or something yeah. like that because the opportunity online, right? Yeah, I, I believe that. Like, I, you know, you just get the you get the sense of of you know, people were all in online right at the beginning, right? I mean, like we you, everybody saw their online numbers just soar, and uh, you know, especially around the Easter time, like I mean, crazy crazy amount of people watching online, and and then you just start to see see it slip, and you you see families kind of just get out of the out of the routine. Like, it's not as big of a deal to to walk you know, into the living room and turn it on on Sunday morning and, uh, or, or in their mind, they think, you know, I don't have to watch it live. I'll catch it later. And and then later never comes. And, um, and you can, you can see how families would just kind of get out of that, that routine of, of going to church and making a priority. And even when you're coming back, you're like, well, I don't feel comfortable coming back. So they push it off even more. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a challenge that churches are going to have to, to work through and, and, you know, still figure out how to, uh, how to reach people that, uh, at the beginning were all about it, but now they've kind of, they're, they're kind of in the middle of online is not a priority and church coming back is not safe enough, you know, for them. And so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's a tough one. It's tough. Yeah. Obviously for kids ministry, for student ministry, church ministry. I mean, it's going to be an interesting couple of years of navigating through all that for sure. Yep. And even if it, we, it, even if like you could get, uh, you know, all the regular people that were connected to your church connected in person again, uh, they're still not going to attend every week. And there's just so much opportunity online, you know, like how mm. could we not keep doing some of these things we're doing? So I'll be interested <laughs> to talk with you, you know, months, a couple months from now or something like that, when you've had three months of meeting in person behind you and online and how are you juggling it? Cause that is hard. You know, it's like two jobs now in one for a lot of people. So I'll be curious yeah. to hear how well, it goes. Yeah, I mean, even even think about like you you sit down, you watch your your church, and you're like, oh, that sermon wasn't that good. And then I'll flip over to Craig Rochelle, you know, and like, and then you're watching Craig Rochelle, and then you're like, well, you know what? I'll just watch Craig Rochelle or what. You get into like, or I'll watch whoever, um, you know that because you're right. Like when you're watching online, it's like it's almost like a TV guide. Like I I can watch any church, any pastor I want. I don't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And so, cause you're not getting that necessarily that community right there. And, um, and so that's, that's one. And one of the things that, you know, we, we said like, all right, we have to really dive into our, our volunteers right now. Like our volunteers are the ones that, that they need to come back and they need to be serving. And so that's one of the things we talked about was like, even if they can't serve in the area that they normally serve in, like give them opportunities to serve other places because they're key and they're, they're leading. And so, you know, if our cafe is not open, have them serve as, as a door greeter or maybe in the kids check-in or, or something like that. And uh, it was really important to figure that out. And we, you know, we even we're adjusting our times. Like we we had two Sunday morning services and a Sunday night service, and we decided we're just going to come back with the Sunday morning services, and then our Sunday nights just going to be online only. And so, um, you know, we we knew we were going to have to shift those things and maybe bring some volunteers from Sunday night to Sunday morning. And um, man, it's just going to be a uh, several months, if not years, of getting creative and figuring out how to to do ministry differently. And um, and part of it's going to be fun, and part of it's going to be miserable so (laughs) (laughs) yeah absolutely that's true it's a good way to say it well 
Uh, I appreciate you talking with us and sharing your experience, you know, online meetings again in person with student ministry and the church and kids ministry, all that. I mean, all of us, I think, just want to learn anything we can, especially for people like you that are going ahead. Uh, you're a little further down the road than some churches. So mm-hmm. how can people connect with you if they have any questions or reach out, connect on social media, something like that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I uh, Twitter is actually Nixville, Nixville, uh, and um, I do have a a blog called studentministrylife dot com, and um, I'm also a regular blogging on youth specialties, uh, things like that. And so, um, one of the things that, uh, like I said earlier, I'm really passionate about is just students integrating into into the church, and uh, we've we've made available a packet, uh, kind of like our findings and. Uh, why we made the decision to do that. And so I can definitely make that available to anybody that wants that. It's just a free resource I love giving away. So um, that's something that uh, that we, we put a lot of work into making that, and we want people to be able to, and churches to be able to use that if, if that's a direction they want to go as well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we can put that link to it in the show notes or however you want to do that. We can figure out a way to, to share that with them. Cool. Sure. Well, thanks for being on the podcast. It's helpful. Hey, it's my pleasure. It was a joy to talk with you. Well, there you go. That's been their experience. And like I said in the intro, I think they're even pulling back on some things now, changing some things, adding more safety measures, being a little less open in light of COVID and cases and things in their area. Here are a few action items I thought of coming out of that interview. One is to thoroughly evaluate your in-person plan. See, they're making some changes now. Uh, make sure if you're meeting in person already or if you're thinking about it, really, really plan that. Think about all the different things. Do you have an answer for contact tracing? Do you have an answer if somebody catches it? Who are you going to like? Who are you communicating with? And what are you saying? Uh, all kinds of things to make your your make sure you're prepared for that. A second step would be to check out his resources that they used, and then last create your kind of in-person and online must-have list. Like if you're going to have to do both things together, like they're doing online plus in-person, what are the things you must have as you do both? Because there's going to be have to be something you say no to, right? You just can't do everything. So what is on the must-have list for in-person? What's on the must-have list for online? And then what is just going to have to wait, get you know, you know, paused, stopped permanently, whatever it might be to make time to do both of those things well. Uh, as you can get all the links and notes at nickblevins.com slash episode 201. Sign up for that Your Ministry Boxed webinar with Ministry Boost. Go to ministryboost.org. We'll talk all about the boxes you can create for your ministry to help with engagement. And then if you're interested in jumping in the New Digital Church, uh, just go to the newdigitalchurch.com. We have already been through one week, and you'll have to watch that on demand, but you can join the other sessions live. So thanks for listening, and I'll catch you next time on the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.